thank you for, for your comments. Uh, it's a really interesting uh, uh, topic, UBI. I'd like to make two uh, comments and invite your, your responses. One, um, oh. one <laughs> uh, UBI might be helpful to maintain aggregate demand, Keynesian theory, in a world where wages and jobs are uh, in decline. Two, the RBA doesn't like QE, but there's $20 trillion of QE floating around from the major central banks, What's plus quantitative easing. quantitative easing, printing money, unconventional monetary policy. Could the RBA be persuaded to have QE to partially finance UBI? Would that make sense? Thank you. Well, certainly Guy Standing has uh, written at length about using that money instead of pissing it into the bank's pockets, actually giving it to people and stimulating the economy. And in 2008, that's exactly what the Labor government did in this country by giving people money and it, it kept us out of recession. Um, but, you know, one of, the, one of the easiest ways to fund a UBI is uh, been revealed by uh, Mossad Fonseca. If, if the bloody rich in this country paid their taxes, we'd be right. So I, I hate to agree with you, John. <coughs> Uh, because I know we want kind of a, you know, a fight here, but I, I totally agree. I mean, Australia is known throughout the world as uh, having really escaped brilliantly from the, the crisis in 2008 because of the Keynesian stimulus that it did. It gave money directly to people. We all got checks, and we went out and spent it. Ha! Huh, who thought, right? And it's just, I mean, it's, it's been lauded in the economics journals of, you know, what a great example this was. In terms of whether, you know, I mean, I can take the devil's advocate position and say if you just print... $370 billion worth of money and then give it to people who, for not actually contributing labor to the economy, that's probably not such a great idea in terms of uh, the value of the Australian dollar. Um, but at the same time, I think uh, if, you know, if we want to pay people directly who are struggling with money that is coming out of, you know, policies, and, and that coming out of monetary policy, I don't see a, a reason not to do that as long as that figure doesn't get too big. Hello. I would like to address two issues I had. Uh, with with your speeches, um, one was the first speaker. I thought I'm bad. I'm really bad names. Um, even even people I know, it's it's abysmal. <laughs> um, yeah, John and Gigi. Okay, um, with John, your forms wait that if that you were that you were talking about in the end were semi admirable to a degree. But they were too. But they were honestly sounding too moderate for actually getting any any legitimate change in this country with this current system, because the wealth availability that actually is is actually much more available. But it's being hidden in multiple gridlocks and multiple family trust funds. Honestly, um, and there's so much in the constitution defending the bourgeois class, honestly, at this point, that even moderate forms are fucking pointless for it. Um, and, and to address Gigi, um, your, your point on how it's unavailable to happen as of right now is similar to my first point. And I would say, yes, it could be available, but actually serious reform needs to be done, if any at all, if you want to actually have it happen in any respect. So I'm not completely sure I understand the point, but I think what you're saying is that we shouldn't be uh, incrementalist. We should be wholesale about the approach to political reform in the country and economic reform in the country. Um, I guess I have to confess that I am somewhat of a pragmatist. Um, and as much as you know, one can say, well, we, it would be great to change all of these systems all at once radically, I just do not see that happening in our generation. Um, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there will be a revolution. I think anything that might cause a revolution would actually be connected with the sorts of things that are in this book, and you would love this book. 
I'm bad at names as well. You were at my table before this. I don't know what your name is, but you would seriously love this book, so read it. Um, there is definitely, you know, there are signs of growing uh, frustration amongst classes in, in other countries as well. I mean, we've seen that in the, in the vote for Trump, in the Brexit vote, in these kinds of, you know, crazy political things. And if people get unhappy enough, maybe there will be revolutions. But that's what you would need, I think, to really have a wholesale reform of, of all of the different systems in this country. So that's why I, I push for the incrementalist stuff, because I think it's actually achievable, and it could actually help people on the ground you know, next year or in five years rather than in 50 years. Right, well, we'll start with the $13 billion of the, far the cotton farmers that have ripped off the water in this state. Um, then we'll get serious about redistribution. Thank you. Maybe we can start with the 26 or $30 billion in superannuation tax concessions that go to the rich and that would do quite nicely for a start. And I think it also, you, did you missed out the fact that we'd get quite a bit of that money back because it would be taxable. So it's not going to cost nearly as much as it can. But I could sit here, I mean, I've, I've got a lot of questions which I can't get into at this stage because I won't have the time about the fact that you don't understand the welfare se sector and don't understand we've had so many attempts to reform the welfare sector. John would remember that. So many different reports, each time with more conditions here, trying to fix that bit there, trying to fix that bit there that we need to say, take something radical. And I just think the UBI would give us that opportunity to do so. But I, what I would like to put up is, because we can argue interminably, do people work afterwards? Does it improve this? Does it improve that? I'm going to suggest a step one, which I'd like everybody to think about seriously, because it wouldn't cost us anything. In fact, it would save us money. If we replaced the cashless welfare card and the basics card in the Northern Territory, which has 25,000 people, 70% of whom are indigenous on the card, which removes people's sense of dignity and control over their money, that if we remove that and replace it with a UBI, it would cost us less because we would not have to have people policing the actions on the people there. So I would suggest that all of us, instead of bickering as to whether or not people work and whether they don't work and whether they actually produce productive stuff, that we could actually do that. It would actually solve an indigenous problem and I'll raise the female problem again because I raised it earlier too. We have a genuine wage gap because women, it's not about domestic violence, it's not about sharing household income, it's the fact that women do the, the bulk of the unpaid work and the caring work. And a UBI would actually recognise the fact that many of us, in many different ways, contribute socially. And we can start looking at the introduction of a basic income to get away from the idea that the only income you can have and the only way you can be productive is by having a paid job. This is a Western influence that comes out of the bloody stupid Industrial Revolution, which we're finally sort of working our way out of. And I just think we need to get back to the idea and learn from the Indigenous people who've managed for years without having waged labour and we keep trying to turn them into sort of, you know, white male dead shits who are sort of self-interested and get a mortgage. So maybe we could actually learn from them and learn from the fact that when they actually had a process where they actually had the original CDEP thing, that they actually worked on country, they did all sorts of things, they produced all sorts of things within the communities. There's many ways of doing it, but I would suggest that we actually suggest to the government that they save money by introducing a UBI instead of a basics card, ask the Indigenous communities whether they want to make it totally unconditional, get rid of the stupid CDP thing instead of the CDEP that we've got beforehand, and show probably since the... Uh, Debit, whatever it's called, the, uh, the basics card has been shown by the University of New South Wales despite their best efforts to try and find something positive to say since they had a million dollar evaluation, that they actually did find the only thing that they could actually say at the end of it is that some people liked it and thought it was doing them good. So, that, so I think we need to actually start thinking about how we use the possibility of a UBI to introduce the idea and maybe gradually extend it out. I'm quite happy to bring it in gradually, but a two-year trial at no cost could be done now. And I suggest that everybody gets in their asses and does it and stops arguing about who owes what and whether people work hard enough. Thank you, Eva. <clears throat> uh, so again, I, I hate to agree with you, but uh, I think the idea of uh, trialing in rural indigenous Australia, as, as I said in my talk and, and perhaps beforehand, is a, a really good idea. I think you had your time. I think you had your time. <laughs> yeah, but you said rural and it's not rural.
Okay, so the reason for rural is because that's where the worst outcomes are. So I think the idea of putting a, putting a box around something that's feasible and where people are already getting uh, some sort of assistance from the government and is highly conditional and replacing that with UBI for those people is a good idea. The problem is when you end up with a system where uh, everybody is getting it and then you, the costs blow out, right? And so I, I think I'll agree with you about that. In relation to unpaid labor, it's a very interesting topic. I actually have a couple of papers just out this month and last with a colleague in Richmond, Virginia, uh, looking at unpaid labor by women and men using the HILDA data. So I'm actually quite familiar with that. I also have a book called The Economics of Multitasking, which is about unpaid labor um, in, in, in many different areas. Um, basically, unpaid labor is subsidized by the government because it's not taxed. It's not monetized, so it's not taxed. And so it does actually get subsidized, and people are doing it anyway. So the question of whether we should pay people to do what they're doing anyway is somewhat fraught. Um, but I don't actually think that's the best feminist argument for UBI. I think the, the best feminist arguments are the ones that, that I made, but you know, we can disagree about that. Um, the real question is, what's it going to cost? Do we need to think about net cost, not how much is actually paid in the universal basic income, but how much has got back? And that's why I want to pay Gina Reinhardt, because then we'll have tax collectors, sufficient numbers of them, to check up on tax cheats. At the moment, two-thirds of these compliance officers are checking up on diddly squat amounts in the welfare system. Let's get real about people paying the appropriate amount of tax. Yeah. If, if, if I could just chip in a little there, I, I might say that uh, following John that I, I did an interview on radio a while ago about UBI and uh, the radio interviewer couldn't get over this point that why would you make the payment to wealthy people? Uh, if, if, and I said, well, because, you know, you actually get most of it back as long as you police the taxation system properly. He, he just was stuck on this. He couldn't move on to discussing any other aspects of it because <laughs> it was like a, a, a mental block. But I, I, I really value your comment that this could be a vehicle for actually getting a better getting taxation better tax system. system. Yeah. Next question. Yeah, hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, you know, when we talk about the cost of a, a universal basic income, my question is how can we afford not to have one, mm -hmm. yeah. given, given the fact that a, a universal basic income will help to decommodify human activity, creating socially useful work outside of the market, leading to a steady state degrowth, decarbonised economy, which will end the growth fetishism and consumerism of the current system and is environmentally sustainable. And the economist Guy Standing, in his new book, Basic Income and How We Can Make It Happen, read it, everyone, argues, we must have a new income distribution system. The old one has broken down. Real wages will continue to stagnate or decline in OECD countries. Inequality, insecurity, poverty, and the emergence of a precariat class without an anchor of stability will continue to grow. This is a recipe for economic instability, right-wing political fundamentalist extremism, and a lo whole lot of other nasty things. The UBI will serve as an effective new mechanism, form of income distribution. Its time has come. Thank you, Bill Shorten. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, I think we'll take that as a, a, a comment. Th thanks very much. Thank you, I'm Geoffrey, GG and John. Um, I think the very key thing here is framework because what we're trying to struggle is between the inflationary effects of a UBI and will it be adequate given our, given our tax base? But I'll, 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 I'd like to call attention to a case in, of the Jubilee Line in London, which cost five billion pounds to build, but raised real estate values by 13 and a half billion. And to ca calling attention to that case, we might be looking at, we can't use the same economic model to achieve a UBI and end poverty. It's pretty much like using a propeller-driven plane to go at the speed of sound. You're going to wreck the plane and have a bad accident. But having, having uh, discussed the Jubilee line, it also shows that the government generates economic values that go to the pockets of the wrong people. When you look at how much it's spent on the Jubilee line and who 
got rich from 13 and a half billion dollars uh, pounds in increased real estate. Second problem is more than 95% of our money in circulation is really lent into existence by private banks. When the gut should be in the hands of the government to build these infrastructures that raise land values and economic rents, that should be monetized and eliminate poverty. Because by gum, I'll make a bet that if we properly design an economic system, we can eliminate poverty within our lifetime. So uh, I, I think that's a, a very, uh, very topical thing to be thinking about. Um, this notion of infrastructure by the government and uh, and you know how to give money back to the people from infrastructure investments. Um, there's a, an article actually by one of the co-authors of this book, Paul Freiders, called uh, "Clean Money in a Dirty System." And it's about rezoning favors in Queensland and how um, basically they have been handed out at the local council level to people who are more politically connected. Uh, and they've done a very, very careful, conscientious study of the, the land values on, um, in, in Queensland, basically looking at who owns properties on either side of the rezoning lines. And it turns out the politically connected ones are the ones who happened to have their properties fall on the inside, yeah. and the unpolitically connected ones are the ones on the outside. And if you could think of a, of a way to monetize that, that money that you you're creating by having a rezoning, right? Because it's basically just a free, you know, check to the person who has the property that can be rezoned, and and bringing that money back to the public, and then spending that on government welfare projects, public goods, you know, health, education, transport infrastructure, etc. I think that's just uh, it's a no-brainer, and we should be doing that. Uh, in many other cities in, in Australia. So I completely agree with you about that. And I also say, you know, this the the, the whole program of having the government. Uh, deliver productive labor to an infrastructure project has happened before in many other countries. I mean, obviously, the Federal Works Project Administration in the U.S. to get us out of the Depression, partly. Um, and, you know, the Jubilee Line is another example. But that is different from UBI if, if we're thinking about UBI not being connected to productive labor. Um, because it's, you know, you're, you're, you're writing checks and then you're hoping that people will, will work more or differently or more productively or something like that. But there's no necessary tether. And that's the thing as an economist and a practical person that I've wanted to see. If we're going to do this UBI thing with taxation, what are the actual figures? How much actually are we going to be able to give, get back through a taxation system, whether it's the one we have now or a different one, which maybe would be better, actually. Um, if we're going to introduce something as radical as a UBI, let's go for a radical taxation scheme mm. change as well, right? Why, why do we stick with the current taxation scheme? There's so many other things we should be doing. Your land taxes, transaction taxes, have your taxes on corporations, all these other things. So if we're gonna if we're gonna push for revolution, right, with which means you know pushing for a UBI, then push for these other things as well. So I think that saying, well, we can have a UBI, but with the current tax system, it's not as expensive, is kind of pie in the sky. We're we're not gonna get one without the other. If we're gonna do a revolution, we should do both. Agreed. So anyway, that's all. I think one of the central questions is knowledge, who owns it, wealth who owns it, and the question of the commons. Amen. Knowledge is built on past knowledge. Wealth, you hear people talking about getting wealthy from hard work. Ask them whose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That, that, that last question came from Geoffrey Bauke. Geoffrey is associated with the Association for Good Government, which is uh, an exponent of the ideas of Henry George, land taxation in order to finance social programs, infrastructure spending and so on. I, I, I make that clarification, Geoffrey, because uh, uh, as some of you may know he's been handing out leaflets about uh, forthcoming courses put on by the Association for Good Government and a symposium being held this coming weekend on uh, the Georgist ideas. So if you're interested in those things, there's a little flyer that's obtainable from Joffrey about radical ideas of taxation reform, capturing the economic surplus for social benefits. And while, while I'm doing a little bit of a promo, uh, Stephen Langford's also asked me to advertise the protest at the ALP conference, or outside the ALP conference, uh, to stop Westconnex. 
which is a, a classic example of enormous government expenditure for dubious social benefit. Uh, please wear black if you want to attend this process, protest. It's uh, at Sydney Town Hall on Saturday uh, at 9 o'clock in the morning. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'd just like to make a comment and maybe you'd like to respond. Uh, in these discussions of the UBI, for me, a really central uh, issue is the question of, well, the, the, the issue of there being, I would argue, too much work being done today in today's society. Much of it, uh, you know, um, David Graeber wrote about bullshit jobs, and another part of that is, is, is work that does more harm than good. And I would argue there's actually quite a lot of it. And I, I could name some examples, but I, I'll name one for just one little example, or one big example, which might be, the crowd might be sympathetic to, which is, uh, I think it was Ben Bernanke, who was, you know, the, probably one of the highest paid members of his profession at one point, who declared that we were in the great moderation and, and that uh, economics, and I'm sure most of the economists in this room are not allied with his version of economics, but that economics had um, figured out how to never have a recession again. And of course, then they had the GFC a year or two later. And, and so, you know, I would, I would question the value of, of that. And, and I would say that the, that outlook did a lot of damage. Uh, and it seems that, you know, in order to essentially stay at least at a middle class level, uh, people must go and get these sort of knowledge working jobs. And it really doesn't seem to matter too much what the ideas are that, that come out of that. And in some cases, it really, it really honestly, it's hard, it's hard not to look at some of this work and say this is fundamentally about the provision of jobs, not the provision of services, and it in fact consumes poor people as an industrial feedstock into this industry. Uh, and just uh, uh, m mentioning, so John mentioned Bill Mitchell's uh, job guarantee. I mean, here's a, a funny example where, uh, I mean, I think Bill Mitchell says some interesting things, but... Uh, the, the idea, his idea of a job guarantee is you have this work which is environmental remediation, which is surely inarguably a, a social good, an environmental good, but it, that must be paid at the absolute lowest rate, while people who speculate about this idea or that idea obviously ought to be getting paid much more than something that is obviously constructive. Uh, so I would argue, I'd, I'd just like to inject this uh, um, idea into the uh, UBI discussion, that a UBI removes the incentive that creates work that does more harm than good. People are not driven into work for the sake of work. If they think, well, you know, maybe this job is not really doing good, they just stop, they're in a position to stop working. The major benefit of a UBI is it provides security. Security ag against poverty security against compulsion. And no one can be forced to take jobs that are crap jobs. Um, and Andre Gutz uh, said that in the ultimate, a UBI is a permanent strike fund. And what it means is that if you have security, if you have a system which promotes social justice, if you have a system which promotes freedom, you don't need to compel anyone to do anything. Um, so it's interesting that the question of whether people are doing too much work. I thought you were going to go in a different direction, which was people are working too many hours per week, regardless of what they're actually doing. And if we had a UBI, people would choose to work less because they could, and they would prefer to have more time on leisure. Um, so I think some, I read a recent estimate one time recently that said uh, people would, in general, the survey evidence is people would like to work about six hours a day, something like this, on, you know, some productive, focused task. And then other things, you know, they could do little hobbies and stuff like this, but in, in terms of their main occupation, how they see themselves, or a sense of identity, they'd like to have that bound up in about six hours of, week, uh, work, of work per week. Um, but in terms of sort of whether, you know, Ben Bernanke maybe shouldn't be paid so much because he's making wrong prognostications, look, 
this is in our profession this is kind of par for the course we're trying to figure out human behavior and we often make wrong statements and he made a really catastrophically wrong statement you know about economies in general and it's just really kind of overstepping probably but economics has always been in the business of muddling through we're never going to get it exactly right and I mean whether we should be paid as much as we are to do our jobs is I think another question I think I get paid radically too much radically too much because I love doing what I do and I would do it even if I got paid half as much don't tell you UNSW <laughs> <clears throat> um, but then to, to have that as an example that you also put with the poor people who are doing jobs that, that you're saying may be socially damaging. I think the social no, damage that a poor person can do. Oh, okay. I wasn't, I wasn't sure what the Sorry, connection was there. So, so the poor, what are the kind of jobs that the poor people well, are so doing? One example I gave was, was of Bill Mitchell's idea of a, a job guarantee, which is environmental remediation. Now, mm. I'm saying why pay them so lowly mm when that's an unequivocal social good. Yeah, okay, so, uh, so that's not really about, being, about paying people to do something that's a bad thing. You're saying that it's a good thing, and why it's don't we pay thing. you more? So yeah. it's built into all of this discussion. Mm. There's always this line that's never crossed. That, well, of course, all these people should get paid really well, even though we don't actually know if they're doing a social good, or in some cases, actually, it kind of looks like they're really doing... Mm -hmm. Uh, the opposite of a yeah. Thing. Okay. So I guess the best argument is to say, look, at least at least it would be getting that that activity done. If if the government's job guarantees program is focusing on areas that the private sector, for whatever reason, has not seen fit to staff with bodies, <laughs> right? And the government says, well, you know, we're going to pay some people to do that. That's better than nothing. Is would be the argument. Whether it should be paid, you know, more or commensurately with the private sector jobs is uh, is another question. I think the reason why people often say or assume, right, 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 but but people often assume that it should be paid less because if it weren't paid less, then there would be this sort of competition with the private sector, and that's seen as kind of a bad thing. And that's that's the argument. I'm not saying I agree, but that's the argument, right? Uh, can I just add? Um Julia Gillard caused me to vote informal in the lower house in Queensland after she said a job, any job, is good for the simple dignity that work brings. Well, try being a blood taster in an AIDS clinic and see how much respect you get. I'm for unemployed, unemployed People's Embassy, I'm um, Richard Cody, yeah, any um, best form of welfare uh, is a job, right? That's, that's the claim. And so uh, uh, Turnbull's got this idea of uh, paying people for internship $4 an hour, the dole plus $200, okay? So that's, that's the direction they're taking. But uh, the, uh, someone talked about the CDEP, that's the community... Um, Development Employment Program, which was replaced with Work for the Doll. And uh, what I heard from Aboriginal people, I quite liked it, because it's basically you're doing part-time council-type work, but then you could go and get some extra hours somewhere else without penalising. On the Doll, uh, you know, you start earning some money, they start taking it off you. Um, <clears throat> but th this particular proposal seems a bit like universal health care type of uh, idea, where everyone, uh, no one pays to go and see the GP, right? But we know what's really happening with that. Mostly it's people on um, um, healthcare cards, pensioners and people on the dole, uh, can, go, can get bulk billed and other people are generally being charged money to go and see the GP. The flip side of that though is um, <clears throat> there's been, there was a report about how people that are unemployed and disabled and so forth are treated in the medical system and generally they were finding the GPs mostly are not really interested in helping people uh, because it's not much worth their while. They're not going to get much work, right, anyway, right? So we've got to, it's a fairly cruel system. Also, you have to pay and see, uh, to see a specialist, usually. So that's not covered by it. Um, uh, so we did a survey once and asked people, um, if, you, uh, if you got twice the amount of the dole, would you work for it? Pretty much doing anything, right? And, of course, people are in favour of that. The dole in the first place is not enough money uh, to live on. But a final comment is about uh, the types of work we're talking about now. This is the economy is, is surviving, apparently, on uh, building blocks of flats with the Chinese cladding and all this stuff. And useless uh, infrastructure like roads, West Connects, which is just going to the airport, stupid uh, freeways through the inner city, uh, and a tramway here that's... Um, 
just stuffing up uh, you know, lots of cafe strips and stuff like that. So we're getting really stupid infrastructure on the basis of the government saying, well, it's creating jobs. So, you know, maybe we should, should be talking about uh, uh, creating jobs in the community services as long as males are allowed to go to TAFE. You know, they, let, they allow, allow uh, males to do these jobs. Mostly uh, you can't get placements through TAFE if you're a male middle age, for instance. And also disabled people are uh, allowed to do training at TAFE as well. So we shouldn't exclude people and say, well, we'll just give you some money and you go away. We should really allow people to contribute to the economy uh, where they can and not just get sit-down money? At the moment, the uh, current combined uh, Social Security Taxation Department withdrawal can be in the order of 80, 85 per cent, and in some cases, it can be up to 200 per cent uh, that you lose if you earn the income. The beauty of about a basic income is for every dollar you earn, you'll be paying the base rate of tax. And that's all. So I just want to pick up on this uh, notion that work brings dignity. So um, in economics, in the economics literature, there's a, a quite a, a large number of uh, subfields that are looking at job satisfaction and self-identity and general life satisfaction and relating that to characteristics of people, like whether they're married, whether they have a job, what their income level is, and this sort of thing. Um, and it is generally universally found that people who have jobs are more satisfied with their lives than people who don't have jobs. That probably shouldn't surprise most of us. Uh, exactly. Um, and people who are married also, you know, tend to be more satisfied than people who are not married, right? There's a marriage premium on satisfaction. So there are these, there's welfare effects. I mean, if you care about human happiness, right, which is arguably the, the maximum end of the entire discipline, you care about that, then you want people to have what makes them happy. And there also have been studies of how when people retire, they generally have, they suffer negative psychological and sometimes physiological um, effects. So I do think that there is an argument that having a job brings you some degree of, of self-esteem, satisfaction, a, a sense that you have a role to play, you're making a contribution, and you start to identify yourself with that job. You, I am a whatever, I am a professional, I am such and such. That's, that's a good thing. G'day, Frank. I look forward to sending you my next uh, chapter of my thesis. John, I look forward to going to Portugal with you. Gigi, it's nice to meet you after the Guardian debate. Um, I'd say a couple of things. I, I would advocate pursuing full employment, a reduced working week, and a UBI simultaneously. The first thing I, I'd say, one thing, particularly from a technical economist such as yourself, that in, in terms of the maximalist UBI, where you pay everyone the same amount and then you tax it back, clearly you're not paying Gina Reinhardt or Jamie Packer the UBI. Right, you're taxing back far more from them than you're paying to them in the transfer system. So you can argue that it's inefficient on technical grounds, but in, in terms of distribution, the net effect is that Gina and Jamie lose. The second thing I'd say is that I totally agree with you about the gross cost of paying a universal basic income at a meaningful level right now it's not going to be introduced in the next budget by the Labor government or the Liberal government or the Greens or One Nation or Clive Palmer or whoever else. So we need to look at other intermediate pathways towards basic income and that's something I'm personally very interested with working on with the political economist called Ben Spees Butcher, uh, looking at a combination of something like a universal age pension a la New Zealand, like a truly universal age pension with no assets or income tests, and combining that with a youth basic income between the ages of, say, 18 and 25, where potentially we look at a net cost of something like 50 or $60 billion instead of the two or $300 billion that you're talking about. And that that might be a more reasonable step at this stage to consider than going the full uh, UBI at this time. Final observations, I'm from New Zealand, I'm wondering, in terms of getting this implemented, how would you address those people who feel disconnected from decision making, like those who are disabled, those who are young, and those who, um, for example, aren't 
you know, don't see any economic power. And I'd look at two examples in New Zealand, the uh, non-fault accident compensation injury system, and give that an example, whether or not that's got some instructions. The previous speaker had mentioned addressing and targeting things towards youth, but I'd want a question about looking at an economy which has got a large mining component and whether or not you want to take Gandhi's thing, there's enough in this world for every person's need, but not for every person's greed. Are there examples in the world, whether it's India or whether it's, say, Canada or Scandinavia, where there has been enough political education and participation to either start moving on some of the building blocks or the pathways or, you know, a wholesale change? What examples in those sort of societies, either India, Canada, or Scandinavia, um, could you give us some practical workshops um, that we can go out and encourage the beneficiaries of those who are getting screwed worse in the society to join, getting this not just as a talking shop, but as platforms and models of you know, getting it done? Okay, let's take the next uh, comment or question too, and then the speakers will respond to the group. I'd like to extend Juju's earlier comment and um, address the uh, what I consider abhorrent stigma of uh, sit-down uh, unemployed um, receivers of Social Security. Um, I worked as a, a rehabilitation counsellor for over 10 years and I was constantly aware of the humanitarian right to work and the importance of that for identity. I worked with people with severe disabilities, uh, physical and, and mental, and my experience was that people stri did strive for those humanitarian rights and it was important to their identity. And I used to work with people for like nine months, year and a half or something like that, and we often got very durable outcomes, 20 hours of work a week or more, sustained for two, for two years was how we were assessed of our efficiency. And we were efficient e each year, and the investment in, for example, my last, the pilot program for mental health with Commonwealth Rehabilitation Service, at that time had shown itself to be very cost efficient with durable outcomes, with, with very uh, substantial disability support pension recipients. Um, so I um, am disgusted when people um, focus on the fear, their fears and project that with stigma. And I think it's time to look at Australians' own record when we took humanitarian approaches um, and, and assisted people into employment and that we know, we know that many people did strive for those humanitarian rights. What we have is a neoliberalist situation where they don't care about humanitarian values and they're not seeing that Mad, Ma Mad Max, here we come, you know, we will create such a subclass of desperate people. I, I think um, crime is already on the increase, drug use is already on the increase, Australia's one of the worst. We... Suicide has long been... It's terrible. It's terrible. Uh, what we need to do is expose the neoliberal agenda of non-caring and being anti-humanitarian and actually stick them in the guts for it. So, um, any proposals? <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Thank you. Let's take the last two uh, comments, then the speakers will uh, respond. Yeah, I think at a previous um, politics in the pub um, on this topic, um, one of the speakers said that if you if you just give people income, then that money goes straight into the pockets of landlords. So I would be uh, wary of that. I think wouldn't it be better to give people land and housing and fulfil their basic needs in that way? which would be either retained in the hands of the state or the community, rather than 
going potentially to the private landlords. Um, interesting point. G'day. Yeah, he's gone. Um, just back on the, um, uh, the topic on uh, job satisfaction. Um, I think um, if we sort of break up a job and have a look at what a job provides, it's not actually the money part of the job that provides the satisfaction, but it's actually the role that the job that's within the job that provides that satisfaction. So if we could accommodate some kind of way to uh, to uh, um, provide that fulfilment for people within a community, that fulfilment of having a role to provide the community, then um, that satisfaction will be there um, without the need for, for any money. And, and would, a, would a basic income help in that process? It would, yes. Well, that's a very interesting series of uh, comments. Uh, I'm going to ask Gigi and John to try to make some coherent response. <laughs> okay, hopefully I can remember what everybody said, at least to some extent. Um, so let's start with the roles and job satisfaction and, and dignity stuff. So. Um, yeah, I, I just want to yeah, agree again with uh, the lady who worked with the, the disabled for many years, wherever she is now, um, and also with the guy who just spoke. I think that having a role, having a, a, a way in which you are seen by others and yourself to be contributing to your society in a positive way is just incredibly important for people's sense of self-esteem, for their satisfaction with their lives as a whole, for their sense of self, and for their ability to influence other people in the society in a positive way. Um, my mom was a psychologist. And, and I've done work in well-being, and I just think this is obviously true. Uh, so the question is whether or not we can have that um, without having paid work. At the moment, the way our society is structured, with the norms that we have, having a job is, is often seen to be the way in which you contribute. Having a paid job is seen as the way in which you contribute to the society. There are other roles we can also play, but they generally don't have as much status as those of a paid job. Now. Well, change the norms is a great, great idea, right? But how long does it take to change norms, right? So, so my question really is, you know, is that realistic? Again, being a practical person, how realistic is it for us to sort of wave flags in the air and say, you know, society should change? Yeah, okay, it should change. It used to be, it used to be long before the advent of, you know, the Industrial Revolution, which I will disagree with somebody. I think it was a good thing because it's given us things like microphones and other stuff in which we can, you know, use in our everyday lives. But before that, you know, we had people in communities who did have roles that were not remunerated, but they were recognized roles and, and that gave people satisfaction, right? And it's just that now those roles are generally more seen to be the ones that are monetized rather than non-monetized. Um, but there are also very respected roles in the society that are not monetized, like being a mother is generally considered something respectable and a reasonable thing to have in your life as a role. Um, but really, when you look at the people who are disenfranchised today, because of these, these kinds of issues, it's the, it's the middle-aged, white, low-skilled men, particularly in other developed countries. Here we're getting it more and more. I was just at a conference in San Diego where they were talking about uh, the United States problem and it's massive, right? I mean, this is the only group for, for whom longevity is actually going down, right, in the U.S. now. Um, and the suicide rate is, you know, skyrocketing. Opioid rates are ridiculous, right? The use of opioids, off-prescription, you know, sort of addictive uh, opioid use is huge over there. Um, and and that's, that is a, should be a painful thing to people who are, again, worried about human welfare. These people generally are disenfranchised not, not only because of social isolation, but often it's tied with work. They have lost their jobs. And because of the social norms, it creates a psychological pressure for them to have lost their job. Creating a role for themselves, you know, in the community that is not remunerated is too big of an ask for someone who's, you know, 50 years old and, and doesn't have a, even a high school education, much less a college education, and has just lost his job, you know, at, at some factory somewhere because the, the big manufacturing has left. And he's going to get isolated in the community because he doesn't have the respect from other people because he doesn't have a job. And that is going to lead to sadness and, and, and substance abuse and suicide, and this happens so much now. Um, so I think that's just the reality of the situation, and, and that it's, it's, it's unfortunate, it's, it's a horrible tragedy for these people, but the idea that we could change those norms quickly, I think, is, uh, is unrealistic. Um, would UBI, uh, I think that was a really interesting question, would the UBI dollars go to a landlord 
um, you know, and thereby actually didn't say the next step, which was would that then raise prices because now all these people have more money and then they can spend it. And of course, poor people tend to spend more of their money, A, in general, they spend more, and B, they spend more of it on um, goods that they really, you know, that are, that are like food, housing, basic goods, rather than luxury items. So is this going to actually create inflation in the prices of things that poor people use most, and thereby by be even more uh, regressive? Um, so that's something that doesn't get talked about a lot. Uh, I think, you know, look, that's obviously where some of this money would go. Um, nobody's, nobody that I've seen has done the simulations of this, but that's what I would want to push for as an economist. Let's, let's simulate it and see. Get, get, you know, a model of the economy that's not, it's not going to be perfect, but it's roughly okay, and you got elasticities for, um, of spending for poor and rich people. You crank it and you see what happens. You know, are we going to get more inflation because of this? Um, and what else? Practically, where can we start? The notion of politically mobilizing disenfranchised people. Whoever had that question. Um, so, ah, right. So, uh, you know, I, there, well, there's one example that I know of in Alaska where um, somehow the government was able to uh, work out a way to provide checks from the Alaskan oil fields to go to each individual person. <laughs> and we could have done this in Australia from the mining stuff. Yeah. What happened there, right? Total, total dropping of the ball by, by the big political parties, right? And again, I commend to you this book, right? Talking about political parties on both sides, the Labour's and the Liberals, um, who, you know, they are, there is just this huge influence of, um, of, of political connections and moneyed interests above the interests of the Australian people. So I think the mining taxes is a perfect, or failure <laughs> to get the mining taxes, a perfect example of, of an opportunity missed to do exactly that. To say, look, here is a, a resource that is Australia's as a whole. Let's figure out a way with our smart economic brains to lasso the surplus that that's going to create and direct it to the people. That's exactly what we should be doing. Well, <clears throat> you asked about a country that was moving to have a UBI. Um, there's a very good one, very close to us. It's called Australia. <laughs> um, 1975, Henderson Poverty Inquiry. There's a million pieces of work that were done there. Um, also in Canada and the US, there were several pilots that were very important to have a look at, if you're really interested in that economic debate. Um, Disability, you'll notice that I said a UBI is not a standalone policy. It requires a disability policy and a health policy. Um, as for targeting payments to prevent landlords grabbing extra rent, um, poor people invariably don't want goods and services. In India, it costs 10 times the amount of subsidy to provide a dollar worth of food. And that's one of the problems with once you try to supply services. Um, in relation to the quality of jobs, Neoliberals have stolen, with their gig economy, the dignity that employment as a calling once provided people who were boiler makers and carpenters and uh, people who were uh, university lecturers, social workers even. Yeah, <laughs> providing them with dignity was a bit excessive. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was something that we did, that we wanted to do. It was a calling. Um, now it's the gig economy, air tasking, and uh, rabbit, and all that sort of rat shit. Um, I, I think that uh, we've got to find our way back beyond the sort of mist of neoliberalism. Just remember, when people talk about trickle-down theory, 
your thighs are always wetter than your feet. Thank you very much, John. Don't want to lasso your beer. Um, look, I, I think this is politics in the pub at its best. We've got some competing viewpoints. Uh, and this is a classic topic where it's open slather, but not in the sense of left versus right, short-term point scoring. It's about probing how our institutional arrangements can best serve our society. It raises a whole set of questions about the relationship between economy and society and, and what forms the taxation and welfare arrangements play in mediating the, the, those relationships. So, frankly, I, I, I think this is one of the most fascinating questions in modern political economy as to how we're going to deal with the major social changes, environmental changes, economic changes, in a way that's consistent with our aspirations to have a reasonably egalitarian and democratic society. So uh, I, this conversation is going to continue. And I think uh, tonight's discussion has really illustrated its uh, many dimensions and significance. Three weeks time, not clashing with politics in the pub, but on the preceding Wednesday, the night before, that's Wednesday the 16th of August, Carl Winderquist, who's an international guru on this topic, um, is going to be here in Sydney. He's going to be giving a talk at the University of Sydney in the evening, 6 to 7.30, at the Charles Perkins Centre Auditorium. And uh, I encourage you to come along and hear this uh, this uh, significant speaker on, on this important topic. The event is put on by the Department of Political Economy at the University of Sydney in conjunction with the Sociology Department at Macquarie University and Sydney Ideas, and there's some further information here. Can I just but, say, pull quickly on that, Frank, because there are only 20 seats left. Oh, is that right? Okay. And it's free? Yep. But you have to register online, register Troy? Register online and it's free. Okay, good. I info here if you want to follow that up. Uh, so thank you everybody for excellent questions and discussion and hope to see you at Politics in the Pub next week.